I'm Edmund Hayes. I'm a researcher at Radboud University in the Netherlands. Um, and the book I have written is called Agents of the Hidden Imam, Forging 12 Shiism, uh, 850 to 950. And I'm very happy to be here and to discuss it with you. The inspiration behind this book um, was rather circuitous. I did my graduate studies at the University of Chicago. And uh, in about 2010, I took a course called The Buddha in Barcelona, which was a course um, taught between a number of different, a, a specialist in Tibetan studies uh, in Buddhism and a specialist in Islamic and Jewish studies. And this course uh, followed a, a wandering story, a, a story based on the life of the Buddha um, in its various incarnations as it traveled west. And one of these incarnations was the story of um, Barlam and Yusuf in uh, Sheikh Sadduq's Kamal al uh, which is a treatise on the, on the Reba, on the occultation. So I wrote my MA, why is this life of the Buddha or this sort of Islamicized version of the life of the Buddha in this um, you know, massive treatise on the occultation. And, um, and, and through that, I sort of fell in love with this book and became very interested in Sheikh Sadduq and the, the question of the occultation more broadly. So I didn't start my graduate work thinking I'm going to write about Shiism, but I got very interested in this. Um, and when I looked around at the scholarship on early Shiism and the moment of the occultation in particular, um, I found there was a lot of good work on the question, on sort of broadly in the history of ideas and what were the ideas, what were the doctrines um, circulating in the community. So questions of messianism and, um, you know, theology, uh, rationalism versus hadith uh, transmission. But I found less, uh, I found it less satisfying on the question of who were the people uh, who were producing this kind of literature, consuming it, what were their practices, what was their lived experience. So I wanted to look at the occultation. First, I was interested in, you know, what, was the, what were the doctrines, but I became more and more interested in what, were the, what was the social embedding, what were the political processes through which these doctrines became canonized. And that was ultimately the, the book I ended up writing. So that the agents of the hidden imam really focuses on the agents and how they were instrumental in um, getting the occultation doctrine written as the, you know, the central doctrine of 12 Shiism. The main argument of the book, well, there are a number of different arguments, um, and I guess they are uh, produced really through the, my sort of central assumptions or my central approaches, which were based on, as I say, this um, central interest of mine to look at the social and political context. Uh, in which these events were happening. So um, I really wanted to look at how the, the occultation was, uh, the occultation doctrine uh, came about through political and social processes. I wanted to look at the institutions through which authority was projected. Um, and so, um, so I, I looked at these agents and I questioned, well, what is what was their political role? What was their institutional embedding? What were the mechanisms through which their authority was instantiated? Um, and I see this as a transition from agent, wakil uh, in the Arabic, to safir, um, which I translate as envoy. So in most of the early narratives about the occultation, these figures are actually called wakil, just agent, which is also the pre-occultation word. And these are the men who are charged with carrying the letters of the imams uh, to and from um, members of the community. Um, they're charged with collecting the alms, so the khumps and the zakat, which they bring to the imams. Um, so this is their, you know, this is their job. This is their institutional role. So it wasn't inevitable that these people would become um, the spokesman 
for the for the hidden imam in the occultation era. Of course, they play a very important role in the community, but there are also other people playing important roles. There are the scholars, um, who I I don't think are identical to the agents, though sometimes I think in past literature there's been a tendency to conflate agents with scholars, but I would see these as clearly distinct roles. There are people who write books and there are people who carry letters and money to and fro. There is, of course, overlap. So anyone who is a, um, a trusted uh, companion or follower of the imam, um, because of his scholarship, perhaps might also be asked to carry money to and fro. Um, <clears throat> but then, so I, I have the, I see, I look, focus on these agents and I plot the transition to this figure of Safir, which is not, um, I don't see it as, as being an, an word and an idea that we have immediately upon the death of Al-Hassan Askari in 874. Um, I, the idea of the Safir is the one supreme designated agent who uh, is the, this, designated intermediary, the designated spokesman for the hidden imam. And I think that takes a few decades to develop. Um, and so the, I guess the central um, arc of the book or the central argument there is, is plotting how that development from agent to envoy occurs. Um, and yeah, there are there are lots of twists and turns along the way. So I, the book more or less is structured chronologically, um, starting before uh, the occurrence of the occultation, and then going um, to more or less decade by decade until um, nine forty, when the the institutions of the agentship or the envoyship, the sifara, um, collapses, and you no longer have. Um, the this structure of mediation between agents and a hidden imam at all. One of the key arguments that I wanted to make um, is that it's not just the occultation that is a crisis. That is, it's not just the um, it's not just the death of Al Hassan Askari in uh, 874 that precipitates a crisis in the community. You also see another moment of crisis a couple of decades later. And what this crisis is about is that you no longer have agents of Al Hassan Al Askari. So the old guard of agents who were there upon the death of Al Hassan Al Askari um, died out. And that means that there was a break, uh, there was a problem for institutional continuity that people mention. They, some, there are reports that say, I went looking to find the bab, but I couldn't find him. Or, um, you know, things changed when the old agents of Al Hassan Al Askari died out. And so I think there is a there is a sort of two stage crisis. One at the at the death of Al Hassan Al Askari, then an, another a couple of decades later, and that is the, really the moment when the idea of the Safir as the supreme intermediary uh, between the community and the hidden Imam emerges. Um, and it, so initially, I, I would say you have a kind of corporate leadership rather than a single. Um, a single designated envoy of the hidden imam. And though that when that early corporate group of agents who represent institutional continuity die out, then you, you have this transition to the idea of the Safir, the envoy, um, which is the um, idea that's canonized that we all recognize as this sort of um, traditional uh, story of what uh, authority looks like in this period of the lesser occultation. You know, there's an introduction, obviously, talking about uh, methodology, and um, I try and lay out how I treat hadith. So I'm not looking at hadith as many scholars do as a sort of um, a foundation for Islamic law. Um, the way I use hadith, both both uh, reports that um, 
uh, purport to issue from the imams themselves and also the general stories um, that are from this era of the early occultation. Uh, I treat them as, you know, potential historical sources, and I'm very interested in contradiction and the what um, what it means when different sources that the community produces uh, contradict each other. I'm not looking for the one um, truth that uh, that that or the one um, account that must be the factual one. But I, I think that all of these reports are interesting for what they tell us about how the community um, contested uh, the, the question of who the imam is. So that's, I got a, a bit, bit of that about in the introduction. Um, the first two chapters are about what happened before the occultation. So how the agent's um, uh, authority was structured in the community before the uh, occurrence of the occultation, and also um, the crisis that happened before the crisis of the occultation, which was um, set off by the fact that uh, Ali al-Hadi, the 10th Imam, um, designated um, his eldest son, Abu Ja'far Muhammad, as Imam, uh, and, and this person died uh, before his father. And, and there was, and so you have a number of different, so, not just Al Hassan Al Askari, but also his brother Jafar, uh, Jafar ibn Ali, who was known to the tr tradition as the liar, Jafar al Kazab. Um, you have these various figures contesting imamic authority. Um, and so the short uh, Al Hassan Al Askari was only imam for six years. Uh, and there was always this question um, over his imamate. So that is the crisis of the occultation is already preceded by a crisis over who who should the imam be before then. Um, the Then the, the story, I think those are preliminary, I guess, chapters one and two. The chapter three, really, um, it's where the rubber hits the road. And it's about what happens immediately upon the death of the uh, of Al Hassan al Askari in 874. And what you see is uh, there are a number of events that happen straight away that um, dictate or not dictate, but that um, are crucial in um, in how this contestation of of imamic authority is going to um, going to play out. Um, so there's a number of things. Some of them are, um, I guess you could say, symbolic. Um, and uh, others are material um, foundations for, you know, authority in the community. So the symbolic ones include who's going to pray over the uh, the dead imam, who's going to say the funeral prayer. Um, apparently, there are stories that say Jafar al kadhab tried to do, uh, to do this. There are stories that say it was a one of the Abbasids, Abu Isa ibn al-Mutawakkil. And there are others that say that um, the young child, the hidden imam, uh, comes and says the funeral prayer. Um, on the material front, there are contestations about who's going to take hold of the property of the, of the 11th imam. Uh, and this is a contestation between the mother of the 11th imam and his brother again, Jafar al-Kabbab. And I think this is important because I think material property is not just, it's not just nice to have, because it's nice to have money and houses, but it's also uh, has a symbolic aspect. So I think probably um, one of the ways that you as a believer in the community knows who the imam is, is because he lives in the imam's house and he has this, um, the trappings of imamate, the trappings of authority, which includes wealth and, um, and control of these the symbolic locations of, of the imamate, the house, and such like. Um, so that's chapter one. It all cha um, chapter three rather. Chapter three also looks at this uh, uh, report that the hidden imam um, was the son of Al, -Al Hassan Al Askari, but born after his 
a death, not before. Um, so there was an idea that one of Al Hassan al Askari's um, concubines was pregnant upon his death, and the Abbasids uh, impounded this woman and checked out to see if she was um, she wa was indeed pregnant. And this, there are suggestions that this is one of the reasons that the um, inheritance was not divided up. Uh, and allowed for this contestation between Jafar and and, and the mother of Al Hassan al, al, al Askari to continue contesting the um, the inheritance. So that's chapter um, three. Then um, chapter four, five, and six. I look at um, the what are the canonic, canonically seen as the second, third and fourth of these agents. As the first agent, I, um, I see is slightly separate. He, you don't see a lot of reports about him being active during the occultation. You see him as um, being an eyewitness to the birth of the hidden imam, but you don't really see him in this uh, classic role of the agent carrying letters from the hidden imam and from members of the community back to the hidden imam. So I see him as a slightly different figure. I see him mainly functioning as a, yeah, as an eyewitness. So he's, he's a sort of um, uh, more of a witness than, an, an, uh, 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 than this Safir in the full sense of somebody who's saying, I am, um, I am um, the, the representative of the hidden imam at that point. And then, uh, yes, five and six, then are looking at Abu Jafar, the, um, uh, and, and then Ibn Rawah al Nabakhti and a summary. So, the, um, the, the, so it's a sort of rise and fall uh, story to see how, how they um, engendered their authority and, and how, how and why that authority eventually evaporated. Uh, so mainly scholars and students. Um, I, I I didn't um, I, I did go very much into the weeds. So there's a lot of uh, I don't just pick here is one narrative and that's the, the the one that I think is is the right narrative. I I set up you know here are two contradictory stories and what are the details of these stories and um, what might be behind these different interpretations of events. Um, so that's not really, you know, perhaps not for the for the general public, unless you know there's someone who's very interested in it. So I'm very happy for a broader a broader public to to read it if they want. But mainly, it was a scholarly intervention. Since I've written the book, I've been very interested in the same questions about who holds authority in the community and how that authority is instantiated, um, but for earlier periods. Um, so I've been looking again at agents for early periods and also mechanisms through which the Imam communicates uh, to his followers. So I've got articles on, on letters and how letters um, embody the authority of the Imam to the communities, how, um, how they're carried, who carries them, um, these sorts of things. They're really focusing down on the institutions of the imamate. Um, I have just submitted a, a, a proposal to the European Research Council for a larger social history of the imamate from Jafar al-Sadiq uh, until, until the occultation. So fingers crossed on those ones. <laughs> 